Nothing quite breaks immersion for me, like finding the exact item I was hoping for in a local shop or some random chest of loot liberated from yesterday's baddie. Sometimes it all feels a bit staged. There has to be a better way to do this, right? Well, instead of asking your players what they want for Christmas, why not just give them the tools to create whatever they want instead? It can be hard to imagine what enchanting or crafting magic items would look like. However, many groups forget that the DMG and Xanathar's Guide to Everything both give some very basic rules for crafting magic items, though they leave a lot up for interpretation and only really provide a basic foundation for a relatively incomplete system. And although there are other supplementary materials for this, I've found that these sources often overcomplicate the process to the point where players might feel as though crafting is a bit of a chore, like a random side quest in a role-playing video game. So for this reason, I've found that most campaigns completely ignore this part of gameplay. Thusly, I set out to strike a balance between it all, to create a system that remains flexible and flavorful with rules that excite your players and promote incredible roleplay opportunities instead of disenchanting them and squashing their sense of wonder. As you can imagine, it's a fine line to walk, so to explain this properly, let's start at the beginning with the tools needed and the methods by which an item can be crafted or enchanted. Xanathar's Guide to Everything describes the crafting process of typical mundane items plainly by only suggesting examples of what tools might be needed for certain types of crafts, like smith's tools for armor and weapons, or weaver's tools for cloaks and robes. This much should be fairly obvious, to say that when crafting non-magical items you hope to enchant, this all should be pretty easy to guess at. Here's a list of all the tools in the game. I'd wager that aside from a few options on this list, they largely go unused or completely ignored by most groups. I know they didn't often come up for me, but now we're going to change all that. After all, a character's tool proficiency represents a trade that they've taken on that likely plays into the character's identity, and ignoring this stuff seems like a missed opportunity. But we're not extremely interested in the crafting of mundane items, are we? So how does this relate to enchanting some super cool and flavorful magic items? Well, Xanathar also mentions that it's necessary to have a tool proficiency or proficiency in arcana in order to enchant a mundane item. And as you can guess, this leaves the method by which the item is to be enchanted up to the player to decide and the DM to interpret. But why stop there? Far too often I find that spellcaster classes are given the leg up over martial classes, even in things such as this that martials should excel at and benefit most from. So for this reason, I allow anyone to enchant an item by using any relevant skill check that they're proficient in and can relate to their method of doing so. Yet, tool proficiencies can certainly aid you in this endeavor, allowing you to double your proficiency bonus for checks to turn a normal item into a magical one, but they are not necessary in my system. Think about it. Perhaps the barbarian hopes to enchant his favorite axe using the tooth of an adult red dragon he felled. Though not proficient in smith's tools, perhaps he toils away with the tooth and an athletics check to carve deep grooves into the metal of his axe over an extended period of time, leaving behind trace amounts of the dragon's essence and allowing his blade to deal extra fire damage. Or maybe the cleric wishes to enchant an amulet using the eye of a quaddle that made the ultimate sacrifice protecting the party. Even without tools, the cleric might sit and pray over the eye as a religion check, pressing it to the amulet while clutching their holy symbol in the other hand, ultimately creating an item that grants limited true sight or immunity to scrying effects. Maybe your fighter could paint on an assortment of symbols they know from the history of their clan with the blood of some outlandish beast to turn a common blade magical. Runes carved into the blade shine brightly as the magic within begins to manifest. Its silvered edge catches the moonlight and a soft hum emanates from the saber. It has a pleasing weight as you try a few practice swings and realize this is a weapon forged for a single purpose, to slay monsters. Oh, and if you're looking for more ideas like this, you should probably check out this video's sponsor and the author of that last interpretation, Describe. Their service offers nearly 7,000 different finely crafted descriptions for just about anything you might need in your next D&D campaign, whether you're a DM or a player. And they've even offered a generous 10% off your first month by following the link in the description and using the code CONSTRUCTEDCHAOS at checkout. So thanks again to our friends over at Describe for the wonderful words as well as sponsoring this video. Now back to crafting. 
Opening up the possibilities for everyone to enchant in this way creates a ton of unique roleplay potential and flavor while also making a case for the advantage that tool proficiencies can provide. And the best part, your players will feel excited by the possibilities instead of feeling turned off and restricted by the rules and requirements laid out in Xanathar's. Sure, this is a simple change, and arguably more simple than what the guide has presented to us, but it's just the beginning, so let's talk time and money. When it comes to crafting non-magical items, the sourcebook says that we'll need half of the item's selling cost in raw materials, represented by gold, and a number of work weeks to craft it equal to that gold amount divided by 50. Perhaps some will disagree with me here, but a work week, which is five days of roughly eight hours working each day, seems a bit long for the crafting of, say, a couple of great swords. If one is truly proficient in the tools needed to craft something like this, I feel as though the time necessary for its completion would be less than half of that. And honestly, in a fantasy setting with characters that exhibit great feats of heroism against mighty foes and live to tell the tale, I find it hard to believe that it would take any of them more than a single day. So for this reason, I play with this exact precedent instead, under the presumption that my players will not abuse this to make obscene amounts of money and flood the local economy with mass-produced weapons with a logo etched into the pommel that looks blatantly phallic. <sighs> If you want to leave this as is because your players will definitely take advantage of it, feel free. And if you're enjoying where all this is going so far, also feel free to like the video and subscribe to the channel. That takes zero work weeks and will cost you absolutely nothing. Thanks. So let's get back to the really fun stuff, creating and enchanting magic items. Xanathar's once again provides us with a foundation for how long an item may take to craft, as well as any cost associated with the raw materials needed to do so, according to its rarity. Just do note that this does not include the cost of the item itself. Believe it or not, both the time needed and the gold amount needed is vastly decreased from the original suggested amounts in the Dungeon Master's Guide. However, I'm going to suggest changing this too. For an easy conversion, just like I did before, I decided to treat work weeks as days instead so that crafting a cloak of billowing doesn't take a full week of downtime just to make you look cool. Because honestly, I'm not sure how often during a campaign we're going to get enough downtime to create something like this anyway, even when it comes to just a rare item that would take well over two months to create. And that's without considering the gold amount needed here too. But more than anything, I found it necessary to drastically reduce this time because unlike the suggestion from Wizards of the Coast that crafting a magic item automatically succeeds, it is possible to fail in my system. But we'll get to that in just a moment. To avoid the same issue from earlier of becoming some sort of tax evading billionaire mass producing magic items with questionable tactics that probably cause cancer, I've actually opted to keep the cost for creating such an item as is. 2000 gold pieces might seem a bit steep for materials to craft a rare item, but when you consider that selling that same item would easily go for double that, we want to dissuade players from creating things that they don't intend to keep and use for themselves. At the end of the day, the focus here is to facilitate a process that makes players feel as though they can make their gear every bit as much a part of their character as their race, class, and backstory. So on that note, let's talk about the mechanics that make all this possible using ingredients that players may stumble upon or seek out themselves. From here, we make a complete departure from what's presented in the D&D sourcebooks by drawing a bit on some of the other systems for crafting that I've seen out there. Again, we want this to remain relatively simple, but my true end goal is to disguise my attempts to understand what type of item a player is looking for in-game, instead of asking them out of character or away from the table. I want them to feel as though they created this item or effect, with a sense of discovery, and not a lack of surprise when I give them the winged boots like they asked for the tenth time. And that all starts when the party fells a monster or collects some magical trinket from the environment around them. When I put my players up against a new enemy or into a new location, they often investigate and collect various objects as they're available. For example, when it comes to collecting the skin of a displacer beast, I would have them roll a medicine check to see if they can retrieve it without damaging it. And similarly, when they attempt to carve a cluster of crystals from their rocky bed, I may have them make a nature check. In my experience, the DC for this does not need to be abundantly high for most things and should likely vary with the projected rarity of the item that this might create. Xanathar's does provide a useful table to guide your judgment when it comes to ingredients gained from monsters, and I've added a harvesting DC as a baseline that I use. 
but you can also feel free to just use the challenge rating of the monster they felled. What's really important here is that the players understand that failing this task is possible. Without risk, the reward can often feel less thrilling and not at all earned. Once our Displacer Beast's skin has been, um, displaced, it's up to the player to investigate over the course of a short or long rest in order to determine the qualities that may present themselves in crafting with it. This is where things really get fun, and you'll want to bring your A-game as the DM. Be sure to ask your player how they're inspecting this ingredient. What qualities are they testing it for, and what methods are they using? Without your player knowing, more often than not, this song and dance will disclose to you what type of item they're hoping to make. And depending on how successful they are with their check, they may even discover additional properties that can be capitalized on. Sadly, there is no one resource for every type of ingredient, effect, or magic item recipe that you might come up with, but there are some books that go into great detail. However, in my experience, the best way to get ideas for this is to look at the stat block of the creature or environmental effects of the location that this was obtained from. Challenge yourself as the DM to prep an idea or two before the session after a player comes into possession of something like this. Even if you don't use that exact idea, you may be able to use it as a jumping off point for the hints your player gives you in describing their appraisal. Finally, with these mysteries made clear to your player and once they have ample downtime in a safe environment conducive to concocting their creation, they'll enter the final phase of enchanting. As I mentioned earlier, it is still entirely possible for them to fail in their attempts to finish their item, even though they'll be able to use virtually any skill check that they can come up with a viable process for. Now, in the early testing of this system, I quickly discovered that having the main ingredient or gold completely lost in the process of this failure after doing so much work up to this point wasn't all that fun. In many cases, I found that it could even compel a group of adventurers to hunt down the same monster more than once with the goal of creating an item that they failed to create initially. If this sounds fun to you, I think that's perfectly fine. However, I like to approach my games by centering them around the main conflicts, the big bad evil guys, and the backstories of the party. So spending a ton of time attempting to farm ingredients can feel unimportant at best. For this reason, although it is possible to fail the crafting check, the main ingredient and the gold cost is not lost. At least the majority of it, anyway. There definitely needs to be some downside in failing an enchantment attempt. Once again, no risk makes a reward feel less earned and less desirable. One could argue that the time wasted in a failed attempt might be risk enough, but in a game where days, weeks, and months pass in a matter of seconds at the table, I don't think it's quite enough to make it feel real for the players. So with a crafting DC consistent to this chart that I made, I like to impose the following failure risks. If a check is within five of the DC, nothing happens, but the enchantment does fail. Checks that are 6 to 10 less than the DC cause one quarter of the gold to be lost, and checks that are failed by over 10 cause one quarter of the gold to be lost and an additional effect to occur that relates to the ingredient itself. These effects could be anything, like a certain amount of piercing damage as the magical power of some ingredient causes the splintering of some wood components that then fire off as shrapnel, injuring the crafter and possibly others nearby, or the escape of a dangerous toxin from an ingredient taken from a deadly snake causing the crafter to become poisoned for some time and to carry with them a terrible odor for up to a week. Being creative with these effects can add a bit to a DM's plate, but it's much easier than you'd think. As a baseline, for example, you could easily just look at a monster stat block from which the ingredient was procured and simply reflavor one of the attacks or actions that it has. This alone will go a long way in immersing your players in the task of enchanting an item and remind them of the creature or place they got this item from. Now, you may argue that such effects are less dangerous during a downtime activity when players have plenty of opportunity for resting and ridding themselves of any ill effects. And that's where you'd be wrong. Assuming the party is somewhere in town, perhaps the enchanter is sharing a workspace with others, or worse, in a public environment full of people. Townsfolk may interpret this blunder as an attack on them, and you may attract the attention of the local guard as you're hauled off for questioning. And if the group is far away from civilization to avoid these types of situations, the sound, smell, or sight of such an event might attract wild beasts from nearby. 
Perhaps a group of bandits that had been stalking your well-stocked party were hoping for just such an opportunity to rob them of their gold and gear. As you can imagine, this can be extremely compelling in terms of storytelling, and could spawn entire sessions spent escaping from a misunderstanding with a city's protectors or tracking down the thieves that stole from you. Here we've turned a potential downside into some really cool exposition for new adventures. And all of this from a system that was completely underutilized and incomplete. All that's left now is to watch your players envelop themselves in the magic of your world, crafting their own items and flavor to become a part of it. If you're interested in more enchanting content like this, be sure to like the video and hammer the subscribe button. Now, as always, go out there and make some chaos.